Hi, hi. So my name is uh, is Simon Littlewood. So uh, we were discussing emerging markets. My background, very briefly, is I spent 25 years uh, living and working in China. Uh, shifted to the U.S. about 18 months ago, and now we're investing very heavily in uh, Africa and other emerging markets. Um, so the the discussion we had was the relative merits of Latin America. Uh, to some extent, Russia, uh, India, Africa, and, uh, and China. Um, uh, and we got on to, uh, to sort of big themes like food, climate change, and uh, the shift of manufacturing from China into the rest of the world, and the discussion of, of where is a lot of that uh, manufacturing and wealth creation going to go to. Um, with the uh, Indian representative, of course, talking about India as, uh, as he did earlier, me putting a case forward for uh, Africa, uh, and a couple of people on the table going on about uh, Latin America. I think the um, <laughs> I think the conclusion we reached was that it's it's not like suddenly China is going to collapse and everything is going to go to one country. Uh, it's more likely that this is going to be dispersed in multiple countries because China created around 500 million jobs in manufacturing. That's not all going to disappear in one go. Uh, and the rest of the world doesn't, frankly, have the ability at the moment to take that up. Uh, so what you're likely to see is certain manufacturing and certain production go to certain places uh, where they have either lower cost labor or the natural resources. And then you've got other countries such as India, which has... Um, it has labor. A lot of countries have labor. Uh, it actually has a lot of IT skills. It has a lot of service skills. It has English language skills, which is not to be underestimated, uh, especially when you're talking to somebody who spent 20 years in China. Uh, so, you know, India has a lot of advantages in terms of educated workforce, English language, English legal system, uh, which a lot of the other countries don't have. Africa, on the other hand, has a a very young population, uh, the youngest continent on the planet, uh, rising birth rate, a quarter of all the people on the planet are going to be from Africa by 2050 at the current uh, population rates. So you've got a very young, very cheap workforce, which means a rising consumer market, uh, which is great, means you can manufacture things and you can sell things, which is very similar to what happened to the growth in China. Latin America has the uh, proximity to uh, the US, uh, still the first or second largest economy on the planet. Um, and it's got logistical advantages. Uh, you don't need to take things by ship. So I guess the overall conclusion from our table was that um, everybody's going to do quite well going forward from the, the movement of wealth coming out of China. The big thing and the reason why, unfortunately, all of my table are now drinking, uh, thanks to me, uh, is because we discussed climate change. Uh, and the, the big elephant in the room, um, in that case being me, uh, is that climate change is going to impact everything uh, because uh, it's going to cause uh, issues like flooding, rising costs, rising heat, uh, which is going to have an adverse impact on lack of food. Uh, so the, the big issues are going to be food, energy, and water. Uh, and that's really the, uh, either the opportunity or the, uh, the potential risk of doing a lot of stuff in the Southern Hemisphere. So, Mark? Any, any, any com comments, questions on that, emerging markets? All right, Safa, VC, private equity, excitement, disenchantment. Well, we didn't really have as much of a cohesive discussion as you guys had there. We don't really have any conclusion because our group kept growing and every five minutes, Mark would bring in someone. So I didn't know exactly how to take that. Was it a compliment that our group has really very vibrant discussions and he wants to add them? Or was he just kind of giving us people who couldn't, didn't really want to join anywhere else? But anyway, we had interesting discussions about different sectors uh, and uh, what people are investing. A lot of people are interested in, obviously, blockchain, in crypto, in, um, in cannabis, uh, we have obviously companies in, in, in deep sea exploration. So lots of new areas that people are interested. We discussed what areas would you not want to invest in. There wasn't really any consensus. There was discussion of groups or sectors that have been overvalued like SaaS and uh, those areas. Um, 
And we were talking about what would not make a company investable. And some of the conclusions we had was obviously around founders. It is really important to have a founder with a vision. It's important for the company to have a moat in the, uh, in the area because clearly larger companies can uh, come up with technologies that will overtake those. Uh, and then we had a second half to our meeting when Jack joined us, and I, I say this obviously quite affectionately because so we had a 361 segment of our uh, discussion about uh, the opportunities there, and I, I say this because I actually do believe, and I'm not an investor yet, but uh, I, I do like the concept that we do need diversity uh, for venture investments beyond Silicon Valley and the coast, and there are lots of values in other areas. Uh, so Jack, can I repeat your offer here or no? Can I repeat the offer you made? Yeah. So Jack, very graciously also. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jack offered to, uh, there is a, there's a million dollar or so uh, tranche of the 361 fund that is uh, Ohio fund that's available and uh, Jack offered to make a hundred thousand dollar donation to Robin Hood Foundation uh, for people who are joining the fund. They're not related so this is not uh, quid pro quo or anything like that but I thought that was a very nice gesture too so something good com came out of our discussion about that as well. It is Sandra's fault. It is Sandra's fault, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Anything I miss? Anyone else want to add anything? Perfect. Well, we had our first, I don't know where, I guess it's already, we'll have our part two of uh, Venture Reset, Rethink, because uh, there's a lot of disenchantment uh, coming out of things like FTX, like why and how could that even happen uh, if you had prop proper funds doing proper due diligence and governance. So uh, next we had uh, real estate and private credit. And you'll notice we have a lot of follow-on events uh, on some of these themes, like the future of real estate. All we need is people to raise their hands and then you're sort of sucked into the machine of doing an event, so. Great, uh, so we were focused on real estate and private credit. Uh, originally, I said, well, what connects these two things? It's rates. Uh, so rates went up. How did that affect both those areas? Uh, but, you know, then we start getting into nuances and really seeing, okay, what's really happening? So, you know, I guess the first point that people brought up were, you know, they said, well, I looked at this property in 2017 in Florida. It was $11 million, and now it's, you know, uh, $13 million versus another person looked at a Property in Cleveland was 70 and now it's 38. So what are you seeing? Okay, uh, you know, we went two different ways for the same, you know, country, but, you know, it has to do with geographics and, and, and the, the different markets. The markets are really determining where things are going. Uh, one member of our group actually made a good point. They said, listen, look at the urban centers and, and kind of governance. It's like, you know, New York, San Francisco, they really have to improve their governance. They're losing their tax base because of maybe, you know, kind of all the quality of life issues that are coming up, whereas Southern, you know, the Southeast is kind of approached it a different way. So you really saw that, like, people are willing to pay the tax, you know, if they get what they pay for, right? So that was kind of like a, a good point that, uh, you know, that really came out. Uh, in regards to kind of some of the numbers or kind of the view, uh, in terms of even LTV, that pe how how deep people are willing to look. So you can get a loan in a property in Ohio, a multifamily project, but they're not going to go as low on the LTV. They're, they're going to, you know, use a much lower LTV versus a property in New York or Miami or something along those lines. But also judicial issues. People view the judicial issues, you know, much more closely. Uh, in New York, you know, it's like a three-year time frame to really get through a foreclosure process versus, you know, other states, it's going to be a lot shorter. So, you know, that that kind of came up as well. Uh, on the private credit side, you know, again, you know, thinking of rates, uh, rates drive things, but it's also the fact that some, you know, a lot of these things, the reason why things are private is because they're not really correlated to the daily market, uh, you know, day-to-day -day rate market. So, uh, 
you know, BFY brought that up. Richard BFY kind of mentioned about, you know, they're not really correlated to, you know, short-term interest rates. Uh, let's see. We kind of talked about banking a little bit and why private lending and private credit has the ability to, you know, make these tra uh, these transactions really banks. Some banks are actually losing deposits. Why are they losing deposits? Because there are more opportunities, you know, people can put money into a money market and make a higher rate and still have the liquidity. Obviously, it's not a term rate, but it's there versus what you'll get. So banks, some banks are smaller banks are losing their deposits. And, you know, they are in, one, they can't make these private, uh, these uh, uh, loans to uh, other real estate opportunities or other opportunities. And two, they may have the to actually put out their loans for forbid because of their regulatory capital is not in place anymore because they're they're losing some of their deposits. I'm not talking about the big banks. I'm talking about smaller regional banks. Uh, uh, one minute. Okay. Last question I kind of left at the end is in terms of just on real estate is just like uh, housing in general. Are we do we have enough housing? Do we have less housing? And again, it's it's more due to the demographic of the. Uh, migration patterns of Americans now versus the demographics. Like the population's growing at only maybe 1% a year, but, you know, the population of Florida is probably growing at, you know, 10% a year. And, um, yeah, it's probably like that. Uh, why is that? It's because of, again, all the points we talked about, governance and, you know, where people want to live and reassessing. And that's really driving. So, you know, project, multifamily projects, they're still getting funded where the migration patterns are going versus, you know, places where the, where the population is coming from. Uh, let's see. That's, yeah, I think that's, a, you know, but yeah, that was, there was a lot there, a lot to cover. Well, again, you can, I'd love to see more of those kind of themes uh, hit our on deck and onto the schedule. And then we've got, um, we did that. We did emerging markets, venture, um, there was this other, <laughs> this other corner table that uh, Lisa Morris um, is going to talk about their takeaways. Come over here, yeah. And then there's public markets. <laughs> and here we go. What's what was the name of your breakout? The pre-gaming alcoholics. So the pre-gaming alcoholics were outside. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the beverages. And um, hmm, this is a lesson in improv. Here's what we learned. Our takeaway was connectivity. We had a fintech, an education tech, an entertainment tech, a biotech, and a data company. Or sorry, biopharma, not tech. And yet what we took away is that through an amazing organization like the 361 firm, we can all connect across our sectors find commonality, and deploy capital. Elegance. Well done. <laughs> Ping pong later. Dan Hupsher. Final round table. And then we, uh, we're going to do a segue, and then one last set of round tables, and we're out of here. Here we go. OK. Can you hear me? All right, so you met me as Mr. Crypto, and Mr. First Time Pickleball. Now you know why I'm Mr. Quant. It's gonna be a bit scary, but don't worry, it gets good at the end. So here's a prediction that came out of our group. In 50 years, computer programming skills will become completely irrelevant. No one's gonna to have to program a machine. Watch out, here comes Skynet, if you remember that movie. So where does this come from? We made three observations in our little group in public equities. Uh, we had a bit of a, a quant party. So the first observation was machine learning algorithms are like kids. They learn from every single thing that you say. They learn from every single thing that you do, whether you intended that or not. So there's a lot of data to be gathered from everything. Second. None of us are really believers in the efficient market hypothesis completely. Equity markets are fairly efficient. Other markets, less so. And quant methods love inefficiencies. 
Third observation, quant analyst skills are broadly applicable. They could be put to anything. So our ask of the 361 community from looking at those three observations was the following. Can we all work together, the public markets people, real estate, private credit, venture, to bring quant systematic methods with machine learning algorithms to real estate, VC, private equity to generate additional returns. So for future events, ask. Oh, you're done? Yep. Can you buy me a minute? Keep going. I'm sure there are other takeaways. <laughs> Takeaway number one. Most of the time we talked about something else and we had a good time. <laughs> So definitely agree with uh, Lisa's notion that 361 brought a, a diverse community together. And looking forward to more events. That's pretty much it. Um, what else can we say about public equities? More, <laughs> I had a friend that had a saying about more wine. Yes, definitely more wine. Who do I like in the Super Bowl? Well, OK, I have to admit ignorance. I had to ask somebody who's in it. <laughs> but I happen to know it's not Cincinnati, sorry, I apologize, and a small town that I went to school in called Philadelphia, so I guess I have to go with the Eagles. <laughs> All right. Um, wow. Tough room, yeah, definitely, okay. <laughs> Further takeaways, where are we all going tonight? Aqua bar? Tonight. After party, where? I think the venue's changed from yep, yachts go. to Fontainebleau. Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. So Fontainebleau, the blow bar. No, no, no. Because if he does, then we have an arb available and Eddie. then we'll kill it. <laughs> yes. Okay, Mark. All right, so we're now transitioning to the last set of roundtables. But to kick it off, we have uh, go to this. We have a few people are going to speak, right? These will be the roundtable. Actually, is it on right here? All right, do a little refresh. But Eddie Vonderpart is investing in all the verticals where we have roundtables. So I thought it would be good for him to just introduce himself and why he's investing in those sectors, because at the tables, as if we didn't talk about it. Five minutes ago, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And here he is. Hey guys, I'm Eddie Vanderpart, and uh, apparently. I invest in a couple of sectors that we're going to talk about. I want to highlight three sectors. Um, and, and maybe first to set the stage, uh, together with Rich Sobel, I founded Virtual Capital Partners, which is a platform for early stage investments in uh, impact sectors. So what do we think impact is? Impact is a, a term that's sort of illegitimately quipped everywhere and anywhere. But for us, that means at the same time optimizing profit as it is optimizing uh, another cause, and that cause can be many different things, but it has to be, uh, you know, improving the situation of mankind. And that can be in healthcare, that can be improving patient outcomes, in agri-tech, that can be more productive agriculture systems, and in climate tech, that can be reducing CO2. And, and, and Simon just alluded to a number of these sectors, exactly the same sectors as we're investing in, not coincidentally, um, health, climate, and agriculture. And there's a big sort of, if you draw a Venn diagram, there's a big overlap between those three. Um, if you think about uh, health, you think about food, food security. That's also a big theme in agriculture. Um, agriculture and energy have a lot in common in terms of CO2 reduction. Um, so that's the, that's the stage. H healthcare, uh, what, what we noticed, uh, uh, and it is a long-term trend, is that we we spend 20% of GDP on healthcare, which is eye-poppingly large and about twice as much as the UK, which is the second in healthcare spend at 11%. Uh, that's obviously broke in so many ways, you can't even imagine. So there must be, uh, uh, from a sort of impact perspective, companies that are uprooting that, and there's lots of 
startups that are, are uprooting that. And uh, with the advent of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, there's lots of companies right now that, that have tremendous amount of apps, um, software uh, that detects uh, uh, diseases earlier, um, through which they can uh, mass scale quite more easily than they used to be. Not everybody has to go through an FDA approval process. So there's, there's long-term benefits in confluence of these technologies uh, that make it an investable space for us. You do need, though, a lot of uh, expertise. So you do need a lot of domain experts, and we also invest with domain experts. A number of them come from the 361 family uh, in order to feel confident about our investment focus and our, our, and our, and our, and our picks for our portfolio companies. AgTech is another one. Uh, and AgTech is, is so important to uh, for food security uh, uh, purposes, and, and I, I'm, I'm sure that Simon at his table talked a significant amount about AgTech. Um, the interesting thing about an investor perspective is that AgTech only has come to the fore in the last five years. 2017, the AgTech investment and deployment of capital was only 10 billion, which for the largest industry uh, in, in, on the planet, that's very, very little. And in 2020, that was already 30 billion times six in three years. Uh, and it will undoubtedly grow very much. That is always good. When stuff grows like that, it means that it's not only capital is needed, but there's large demand for deployment of capital. Um, and uh, whether it be sort of novelty farming systems or, or uh, software to, to track uh, how productivity of equipment is doing on your farm, uh, that type of stuff is interesting and we invest in it too. It's important, but it's also uh, a, a sector that has digitized the least. The farm has digitized the least over the last you know, 30 to 40 years, actually over hundreds of years. Uh, and so it's, it's a necessity, but also an opportunity. And then the third thing is climate change. Uh, climate change, uh, climate tech, uh, dealing with climate change is maybe the most important sector. Uh, and we always like to invest in, uh, in sectors with a lot of tailwind, and luckily, uh, uh, we, we just are, are in the U.S. at least, uh, beneficiaries of a $375 billion, what I call climate cookie, that uh, President Biden gave us with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a massive misnomer, but it does have a tremendous amount of uh, credit and subsidies for folks investing in renewable energies. Um, we saw today an amazing presentation by Chris White actually saying, hey, listen, uh, it's a, it's a really good idea to, to still invest in, 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 in oil and gas. And an interesting thing, even as a climate tech sort of advocate, he's right. It's not going to, we're not, we're, the, 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 the demand for oil and gas is not going to go down over the next 20 years. We know that much. But the, the interesting thing is can we make that demand cleaner and greener? And that's absolutely yes. There's a tremendous amount of investments going on right now in Texas and California that are being the beneficiaries of all those credits that, for example, make renewable biodiesel, that make sustainable aviation fuel. So your plane that you're flying at, which you probably feel a little bit guilty about, uh, reduces the CO2 emissions by 50%. The car you're driving at, if it's not a Tesla, and 90-plus percent of us don't drive a Tesla, and in 10 years ago, 10 years from now, it's still over 80% that won't drive a Tesla. Um, is is that, 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 that the CO2 emissions from those cars not being Tesla can still be 50 or less percent of the current emissions if we use renewable gasoline. Now, that type of stuff we think is highly necessary to invest in in order to save the planet in a literal way, but also advantageous to invest in. Because if the companies are investable right now with those credits, they're more and more investable. So I want to leave it at that. Mark, is that good? That's awesome. You want to go but away and come back? And I'll I want to go through okay. the, out this door and back through the other door. Thank you, Eddie. I don't have two microphones. So listen, right before we... Uh, we're gonna, we, we call this segment um, Philanthropy Impact the Next Gen. So we're going to talk about some, some segment of the next gens. They're going to talk about what their perspectives and they have their own breakout that you can go and learn. But uh, in Naples, we picked up Keep on pick up new new people with perspectives, and if, who knows uh, Jacques Cousteau? Rich, so you don't know who Jacques Cousteau is? Okay. So we met his grandson, uh, who told us about what he's doing 
John Denniston, who was Kleiner Perkins partner, talked about the triple upshift with impact. Uh, he talked about Jane Goodall and what she did. And, and what uh, Fabian Cousteau is doing is the, some equivalent. Uh, and, 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 we, and we know what 3% of the ocean. And they're coming up with, with, with pharma, low tech, a, a, in fact, a species that, that has the, the effects of morphine without the side effects. Imagine that. That gives us hope. So can you just say a few words? Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, you, you've all, some of you have heard me speak. My name is Lisa Maricino. I am the CEO of Proteus Ocean Group. It is a Fabian Cousteau company. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I met Fabian. So uh, they were looking for a CEO in mid-2019, early 2019, and uh, they said, well, I said, so what is Fabian Cousteau doing? And he said, well, he's building this habitat and lab underwater so people can live and work. And I was like, well, that sounds totally crazy. What do you mean by that? And then I learned more. And it's not crazy at all. In fact, what's crazy is that we don't have labs and habitats underwater where we're studying our ocean. We are at the precipice of really big planetary problems. And so the ability to live and work underwater and really study the ocean is what we're going to do because you can't fix what you can't measure. And so we are planning on putting um, a habitat um, underwater where people can live and work once they're saturated and you can uh, accelerate research and development and science and storytelling because you're living underwater and you can dive up to 10 to 12 hours a day. How many of you are divers? Anybody? Okay, so you know the frustrating part, right, as things are getting interesting or that, you know, you're seeing some great stuff. You've got to look at your, your air and you're running out of air and you've got to go back up and then you're, you're, you have to decompress as you go up. So once you're living and working under, once you go underwater for 12 hours, you, your gases equalize, your nitrogen and your oxygen gases equalize, so you don't have to come back up to the surface. So in 2014, he led uh, the longest expedition on what's now remaining, the remaining habitat, 450 square feet, and he lived and worked underwater for 31 days, one more day than his grandfather in the 1960s. So it's really interesting that we're still having the same conversation. But some extraordinary things happened. So they did three years worth of equivalent research. And that's what got me to this job. Because I said, the one thing that we can't renew is time. But we can accelerate it. So imagine a world where we would have Prodi deployed in all the major parts of the ocean so that we can study it and give that information to the really smart people, the brilliant scientists of the world that can help us solve these major problems. Um, so this will be the first time that it's opened up to the public and private uh, sector. And um, so it'll be placed in 2024, 2025. And uh, we're really excited about it. And I'm happy to take any, you connect with me if you want to learn more. Sure, so that's a great question. So it'll be at 20 meters, at 60 feet, so there, and then there's a deeper one. So at 60 feet is where uh, air and oxygen is non-toxic to the human body. So you, there's air being pumped into the habitat, so you can go out and go diving, then you come, you put your wetsuit on, right, go diving, then come back, and you can watch a Netflix movie, you can go eat, you can open up, you go to the lab, you do your experiment, and then you continue your work on your computer. So... We will have 10 gigabytes minimum. Yes, absolutely. So there'll be live streaming. You'll be able to talk to the aquanauts underwater. Um, there'll be all kinds of stories. Hopefully it's not big brothers, big sisters underwater, but I'm sure there'll be some drama around that. But yes, the idea is to tell the stories, the beautiful stories that will be the discoveries that they're going to be finding every day, the species, the new species, um, the fish that will be observing the humans, right? So yes, those are all stories. You can live there um, days, weeks, and months. So the longest, um, the, people ha the two people have lived underwater is 75 days, but there are no studies, right? So space, have a lot of studies about what happens to, to your physiological, psychological effects of being on the ISS for days and weeks and months. But those same studies have never been done underwater. After 31 days that you lose your, your smell, your taste, you do. So it was interesting, like COVID, right? COVID underwater. But those are studies that are very important that are that we will be conducting. 
um, making sure, because we may all be living underwater if climate change keeps increasing. Absolutely. Exactly. As Fabian says, he doesn't want a one-way ticket to Mars, so you can come back from being living and working under the ocean. Yes. Sure. So the first one will be in Curacao on one of the uh, very still healthy reef and one of the accreting reefs, but the plan is to put them in other locations. We have interest from Portugal, Australia, um, hopefully the U.S. as well. A little more difficult to navigate the waters in the U.S., but we will be doing that as well. So multiple locations all over the world. Thanks. We will definitely be doing a deep dive, pun intended, on uh, with with Lisa and Fabiana, and hopefully they'll come to our impact summit, which uh, is March twenty second, twenty third. So, but before we go to breakouts, uh, we met Marin. How did we meet Marin? I know we met, but someone introduced us. The relationship chain. Sylvan, okay. So you, you've you brought a, another chain of, of people, you, and maybe we want to hear your perspectives, what the next gens are focused on, at least your group. So come on, come on up. We've, we've definitely had an eclectic group here today. We had the, uh, well, it doesn't, doesn't matter, but you're, you guys are adding to the rich pageantry here, and literally. <laughs> Thank you so much. So happy to contribute to this amazing and phenomenal gathering. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you, Jim, and thank you, Team 361, for this amazing gathering and opportunity to share about our, our path as next gens. And if I may invite our, our next gen panel to, to join us, we, uh, we, are, we are representing families right now that, uh, that all of our families have these amazing legacies. And so we are all focused on creating what we are calling regen next gen legacies, focused on regeneration. And all of us that are here and that have gathered in person and also on Zoom are representing some leading families in the world that created some phenomenal and world changing inventions, movements, and, and have really in increased and made the quality of life for people all around the world better. So we are so happy to be here and to share with you all about our mission and our path as, as Regen Next Gens, especially now as we move into the golden era of the Regenaissance. We are so happy to be here and to represent our families and to share with you about our Regen Next Gen legacies. So I will I will begin and uh, and then I'll pass the microphone to our to our panel. Uh, my name is Marion Ryan Sorath, and I'm so happy to be here on behalf of my family and behalf on behalf of of what we've created in the world on both sides of my family. Uh, in short, uh, to keep it brief, and then we will and then we'll move into the breakout session to to share more in depth. And uh, my my family my. My ancestors are all refugees and, uh, and from different countries coming to the U.S. And my great-grandfather is the, the inventor and, uh, and the leader of Master Lock. And my grandfather scaled this into a global company. And we are aligned with the values of democratizing access to security for everyone across socioeconomic classes, uh, of providing fair and equal working conditions for, uh, for people of all genders and, and colors in the workplace, and also, and also with providing the inspiration for, uh, for what we are creating, for what I'm and my family are creating now, uh, which is uh, everyone around the world, I've traveled around the world, and everyone has, has touched a master lock. And even in, even in rural areas and in communities, Master Lock is ubiquitous. And so for myself and my, and my legacy and what I'm creating in the world, I seek to create mastery keys for everyone so that everyone can have a key to the world of thriving and opportunities and to democratize access for security and prosperity for everyone. So that's on one side of my family, and then on the other side, my grandfather, my mother's father, is the chief of was the chief of design of the lunar module, and the F14, 
And so, and my grandfather hired Tom Kelly, who is known as the father of the lunar landing. And together with their team, they, they achieved the moonshot and the lunar landing. And so for me and for what I'm creating in the world, I, I seek to, I seek to co-create the, the earth kiss. And how are we appreciating Mother Earth and how are we literally kissing the ground and appreciating her for all of the beauty and all of the abundance that she shares with us. And one more brief story about my mother. My mother and my, my, and my father, my mother has, uh, has organized the annual D-Day celebration in Normandy each year for the past 18 years. And I'm, it's, it's such an amazing gathering of freedom and celebrating freedom and democracy and liberty around the world. And, and my father is a very accomplished songwriter and music producer. And so this year, uh, this year we seek to merge the two in, the, in a project in Normandy for D-Day. And we are, we're inviting the world's top sound healers into the space and to, to have a sound healing concert and a global peace prayer in Normandy for D-Day and celebrating freedom and democracy, liberty and peace. And, and with music, of course. And I believe that sound healing is one of the mastery keys to the universe. It's when we tap, tune in with this, we can achieve quite a bit for ourselves and for, and for our communities and truly for the world. So I'm so happy to share that with you and more soon in breakouts. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to introduce Abby. And Abby is here to share about her family and legacy as well. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Very nice to see you all. Um, so my legacy is uh, Josiah Farron, the cattle king of Wyoming, who homesteaded Jackson Hole and the Grand Tetons. There is a plaque to him today, still the cattle king of Wyoming. I grew up very, very proud of his legacy. He um, negotiated with the Snake River Land Trust and John D. Rockefeller to turn what would have been, from my, his 17 children, uh, neighborhoods into something that we can all enjoy and and uh, and visit today in pristine form as it was for thousands of years. Um, Ten years ago I went to Peru and um, met the Quechua Nation who are uh, still living in their indigenous um, pure lineage. I did not mean to have this experience but it happened. Um, they ended up healing me from complex trauma through psychedelic medicines and changed my life. I did not even know how traumatized and anxiety-ridden I was. And in that moment, my proud legacy became a little bit of shame because I did not realize that when my great-grandfather had done that, he had fenced off the Teton Lakota's land. Um, so it's been a 10-year really interesting journey to zoom out and realize there's more to life than Republicans and Democrats and uh, rich and poor and pharmaceuticals and plants and just kind of really look at like wow, there's a bigger chessboard here, and we're all part of it. And these really humble, beautiful people transformed my life. I've had a really beautiful acclamation. I'm a fashion designer. I've been working with social impact supply chains now for the last 20 years. And so Marin asked me to talk about past, present, and future. Um, after studying with the Quechua for 10 years, learning their ways, becoming a medicine woman with them, I, I now facilitate circles and bring people to the elders. Um, I had a baby who's half Quechua, mixing the bloods, redemption baby. And I now run a company with um, the women of the high Andes, which are these majestic capes that are handwoven. Each cape takes 30 days to make. We're sending about $25,000 a month to the high Andes, which is incredible amount of economy for them, something they've never seen in, their, in any of their lifetimes is since money became a thing they didn't even need to deal with before we changed the system. So um, in the last year, I have uh, met a lot of chiefs. Somehow, all of a sudden, started getting introduced to chiefs here in the US. And I am now on Chief Marvin. Um, oh my gosh, that's swell. <laughs> of the Lakota Small Farms, I'm now on his board. He's a Teton Lakota. We are working together. I'm his communications director, along with my business here. And, um, you know, I told him the story when he, when we met about the, the legacy. And it's been a really beautiful reclamation because when I went to the Amazon in October, it took me five days of traveling into the heart of the Amazon as a guest of Chief Tue of the Huni Queen tribe to find the Amazon. So I had heard about the Amazon, save the Amazon, save the Amazon. 
But to go see it is an opportunity not most of us would have at that level. And I was horrified at what I saw or didn't see. And that was when this legacy of Theodore Roosevelt, who hunted with my great grandfather, who encouraged him to preserve the Tetons. And I've grown up in the Tetons and Glacier National Park. And to see the difference between what's happening in the Amazon and what we've done here in the United States kind of just turned my whole perspective into this really beautiful alchemization of how legacies and you, every one of you in this room has purse strings that you control. And what is your legacy? What is the family you represent's legacy? How can you, in 100 years when none of us are here, be the Theodore Roosevelt of the future? So that's my little call out to action. Uh, if you have any questions at the end, I'd love to chat with you. And thank you all so much. And I'm now going to hand the mic off to Kelsey Julef, also known as Moon. Hi, thank you guys. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Marin. It's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Moon, and I'm going to share a lot of things about the moon today. Um, my name comes from my grandfather, Moon Landrieu, who recently passed away. Um, this is the first time I get to speak about that um, with him passing. And um, he was a, an amazing mayor of New Orleans in the 60s and a civil rights advocate. Um, so I grew up in a really political family in New Orleans in southern Louisiana. Um, and they made an artist out of me against probably all of their wishes. So I'm from a very political family, but I love creating art and changing the world with art. And I had the ability to and the opportunity to get to go to art school. And what that did for me was open up my mind to how free everyone could be if they had the ability to express themselves and express their souls and the freedom to do that when they're not focusing on survival needs and how rich our planet would be if everyone incarnated here had the privilege to enact their genius and to study their genius and work with their genius. So a couple of years ago and for many years as an artist myself, I've been curating and collecting artists around the world that are creating art that is forwarding the imaginations of humanity. And it's always been artists that have been on the forefront of every revolution. So my goal of the past few years was to curate and collect all of the artists that are creating artwork that is inspiring artwork that when people look at it, you don't even understand why you're feeling what you're feeling, but different aspects of your being are opening up and your imagination is opening up to peace, beauty, prosperity, liberty, um, and with imagery really being our first form of communication before the linguist language that we have. So I work with a lot of these amazing people on this panel, just in the world and creating art and traveling, um, creating my own art forms and representing a lot of amazing art collections. Currently one in Miami right now of uh, an amazing oil painter. And I'm looking forward to connecting with everybody after and um, just speaking and sharing on all of the art. And I would like to just pass it now to be conscientious of time to my dear beauty here. Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Um, hi, everyone. To everyone that I haven't met so far, um, thank you so much for including me in this. It's wonderful what everyone said so far. Um, my name is Consuelo Vanderbilt Coston, and I am a seventh generation of Mr. Cornelius Vanderbilt. Um, and in moving back to New York, um, it's really just the greatest privilege to be able to walk down the streets and to go down Vanderbilt Avenue and to go to Grand Central and to really watch what the man who borrowed a hundred dollars from his mother, and he built an entire shipping trade industry. I mean, it's really pretty extraordinary. Um, but more to the point about, let's you know, really look at kind of what my family's done and, um, and what I'm most proud of about kind of, let's say, generations now. So I sit on the board of the Vanderbilt Museum, which William Kissel, um, he, who was my great-great-grandfather, he was an extraordinary voyager. And he would create, you know, and kind of collect all these unbelievable artifacts. And he realized that before he died, it was really important to him that he wanted to make sure that he 
donated his home and his artifacts to Suffolk County. And so it's really been my greatest honor and privilege to be able to support the museum. Uh, Cornelius actually built the YMCA. And so I was able to go and actually take care of the kids and to bring them to the museum and to really you know, keep that because it's such a generational thing and such a wonderful thing that people feel very proud of, the museum feels very proud of. Um, so for me, that's such a wonderful thing to be able to give back and to feel like I you know, have such, um, just I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, so just like all of you, I think it's just such a wonderful thing to in, in building a legacy and to kind of continuing on is about giving back and what's important. So for me, it's always about kind of taking care of the underdog. So my company is called Soho Muse and we take care of creatives and giving creatives the opportunity to get jobs. So everything in my life and purpose is about serving that industry. Um, and so anyone who wants to talk further about that, that is, my world, and um, and please, anyone who comes to New York, please come to the Vanderbilt Museum. It's an extraordinary place, and um, yeah, to many more memories and to many more legacies. So thank you again for having me. Hello, my name is Alejandro Glad. My family doesn't have any lineage or like, I don't come from a family that has been like well known for history. And I'm from Mexico. I'm here representing my country. I'm a proud Jewish Mexican, born in a traditional family that since I was a kid, I was an explorer, curious, adventurous, and being like really always looking for the next thing. And that's why the next gen. I'm 28 years old right now, and I've been considered Mexico's number one NFT artist. I did everything with a fruit, with a fruit that is a papaya. Everything from a single unique fruit that we all know. And from there, I created a, a whole universe, a whole concept is called the Crypto Papayas, which is a whole line of things. And it's a movement called Feel the Fruit, which right now I'm working hard to make a TV show. It's a reality TV show where we, where we show the power that fruit has in humanity, the power and impact that fruit has to connect us, not only by eating, but like feeling, connecting, smelling, touching, embodying it, and really make up the whole thing. And I'm really proud to announce that me and Kelsey and Moon together, we're going to the moon. Our art and our NFTs are going on, on a space mission to the moon on March 23rd in Florida. There's going to be a rocket launch where 222 artists are presenting artwork. And that artwork is going from the Earth to the moon for the first time since 1972. So we're really living in a moment where art is getting to a level of consciousness and of having an impact in the world. So I'm proud and yeah, thank you for, for having us. So. And and before, if I may uh, present, uh, present our dear friends, Prince Lorenzo de' Medici, who's on Zoom with us, I also would love to just recap to see this, this concept of, that, we all, that we all addressed, which is, what is mine to do? And this is the question that I pose for everyone, you know, all over the world, whether wherever, fa whatever family you come from and whatever legacy, that your family has, you know, the question is, what is mine to do in this moment in time? And so with this is the question that we have all been living with and embodying and and sharing our gifts and our talents in the world and and really focusing on creating a regenerative legacy that serves our families and serves the world for the next seven generations and beyond. So with that in mind, I am so happy to present my dear friends, Prince Lorenzo de' Medici, who is zooming in from Italy right now to join us. And thank you so much for leading this, Lorenzo, and thank you for being here with us. Such an honor and thank a delight to see you. Yay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marian. I think it's beautiful to have so many interesting people that uh, are lucky to be uh, second, third, fourth generation of successful people and using their energy, their time to do good things. Uh, 
I think that that's something that keeps not only your legacy, uh, something important for the today, but we have to think about the future. Uh, we are all lucky people. Uh, uh, my family was uh, starting uh, small in the 1200 and become super successful working uh, for 500 years to become a legacy that is still active today. And I hope in another 500 years that my grand, grand, granddaughter or grand, grandson will be proud of what my family. And I think the way is to see what the next gen are doing. And so as a godfather of a next gen and a father of a daughter, I am very happy to be new, beautiful mind people wants to do something good. I think that um, not many people think about how, you know, we have to empowering uh, women, we have to empowering education, uh, we have to empowering art, uh, philanthropy, all those things that were very important uh, uh, in the Renaissance, but they're important for the next generation today. So I think that uh, um, being all together in this kind of event where people can put all their effort, their energy, their contact uh, are very important if we all have a similar similar goal to make the future where we have to have the same rights. I think that the education is very important. I think that uh, art can be an instrument. We see that we, we have few people here that are so lucky that their art is going all the way to the moon. So compliment to you guys. That's the next gen uh, way and absolutely. So I am happy to be here. And if any one of you have any question for me in the future, I'm here to, to answer to all of you. And my family is uh, is a successful family in finance, uh, in banking, uh, in agriculture. We own a few wineries, uh, we own a few olive oil uh, factories. Uh, we own one of the biggest, uh, large uh, art collection in the world. But what is more important is uh, the way we behave for the future generation. And so, so I'm happy to be here and, and meet all of you virtually. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. It's set Thank you so much for being here with us. And and 361 is traveling as a very extensive traveling schedule upcoming. And so we, we look forward to seeing you at a, at a future 361 gathering. Come join our 361 firm community of investors and thought leaders. We have a lot of events created by the community as we collaborate on investments and philanthropic interests. Join us.